Burns hybridize after 60 million years. We're, uh, uh, I was looking at some uh, articles uh, that I ran across uh, looking at Uncommon Descent, and uh, one of them is from Science Daily. And interestingly enough, there's another release that says very similar things. I'm going to let you look at both of them. And then, of course, the article on which both of them is based. The first one is um, Science News dated February 13, 2015. And the short summary is a delicate woodland fern discovered in the mountains of France is the love child of two distantly related groups of plants that haven't interbred in 60 million years, genetic analyses show. Reproducing after such a long evolutionary breakup is akin to an elephant hybridizing with a manatee or a human with a lemur, the researchers say. And uh, the first paragraph says, the delicate woodland fern discovered in the mountains of France is the love child of two distant re related groups of plants that haven't interbred in, in 60 million years, genetic analyses show. For most plants and animals, <coughs> reuniting after such a long hiatus is thought to be impossible due to genetic and other incompatibilities between species that develop over time. Reproducing after such a long evolutionary breakup is akin to an elephant hybridizing with a manatee or a human with a lemur, says co-author Kathleen Pryor, who directs the Duke University Herbarium. Led by Pryor and Carl Rothfels of the University of California, Berkeley, the study appears online today and in the March 2015 issue of the journal American Naturalist. So this is fairly recent stuff. The pale green fern was found growing wild on a forest floor in the Pyrenees and eventually made its way to a nursery where researchers plucked several fronds and extracted the DNA to pinpoint its heritage, its parentage. <coughs> to their surprise, Genetic analyses revealed that the fern was the result of a cross between an oak fern and a fragile fern, two distantly related groups that co-occur across much of the northern hemisphere but stopped ex exchanging genes and split into separate lineages some 60 million years ago. To most people, they look just like two ferns, but to fern researchers, these two groups look really different, Rothfeld said. And uh, I must confess I'm in the most people group. Um, there's the, there's the uh, hybrid fern that we're talking about, um, courtesy of one of the authors of the study uh, on the internet. There is an oak fern, courtesy of Wikipedia. And uh, there is a fragile fern, again, courtesy of Wikipedia. There's supposed to be a couple of photos that accompany the article, but unfortunately I was not able to figure out exactly how to get to them uh, in time. But uh, so there's your, your, your cross fern. You'll notice that it forms the background of uh, uh, much of what we're going to be talking about. Other studies have documented instances of tree frog species that prove capable of producing offspring after going their separate ways for 34 million years, and sunfish who hybridized after nearly 40 million years, but until now, those were the most extreme reunions ever recorded. For most plant and animal species, reproductive incompatibility takes only a few million years at the most, Rothfeld said. The sex lives of ferns may help to explain why divergent fern lineages remain, in, remain compatible for so long, the researchers say. Fern sex is no different from hanky-panky and many of other creatures in that it requires a union between sperm and eggs. But whereas many other plants rely on birds, bees, or other animals to play matchmaker, all ferns need is wind and water. Plants that require pollinators to reproduce may have a harder time rekindling the spark after calling it quits, especially if the animals they rely on to do the deed are picky about flower shape, size, or other traits that may have changed over time. It's tempting to think that there's something special about flowering plants that gives them a competitive advantage, but these results raise a different possibility, Rothfell said. Well, they may still have a competitive advantage in terms of ab absolute numbers. They just can't stick together in the same um, 
gene pool for long periods of time. Namely, for ferns and other plants that don't rely on animal matchmakers, reproductive incompatibility, a key condition for one species to split into two, may simply evolve more slowly. That might help explain why flowering plant species outnumber ferns by 30 to 1, even though ferns have been around longer. This work was sub, uh, supported by U.S. National Science Foundation. Additional support was by Duke University National Sciences and Engineering Council of Canada. And then the story source was based on materials given by Duke University. <coughs> and um, there's a little note behind it saying the materials may be edited for content and length. So it sounds like what they did was they got a press release and they redid it. Well, uh, and the journal reference is uh, uh, the reference that uh, we cited earlier. Um, then there's another article. This one, the source is the University of Chicago Press Journals. A fern discovered in the French Pyrenees is a recently formed intergener intergeneric hybrid between parental li lineages that diver diverged from each other approx approximately 60 million years ago, scientists say. Looks like the same stuff. In an article published in the March 2015 issue of the American Naturalist, it is the same article. A team of researchers report on a fern from the French Pyrenees that has recently formed intergeneric hybrid between parental lineages that diverged from each other approximately 60 million years ago. The hybrid fern, Cystocarpium ruscamianum, um, was found growing wild in the mountains of France and is sterile but can repro but reproduce itself vegetatively and grows well in cultivation. Apparently it puts out rhizomes, branches that are unable to produce roots at, at a certain point, sort of like strawberry plants do, and uh, just keeps growing anyway, even though it can't make seed. Rothbells et al. finding that the two fern lineages are still able to hybridize after nearly 60 million years of divergence is surprising evidence for an extraordinarily deep hybridization event, one that is roughly akin to an elephant hybridizing with a manatee or a human with a lemur. Boy, they keep coming up with that same um, <coughs> analogy there. As population becomes separate, the members are thought to lose the ability to interbreed relatively quickly, usually within a few million years. Um, if genetic change is as fast as we uh, understand from uh, watching modern genetic change, it sounds like it might be actually within quite a few le within quite a bit less time than a few million years. This process, the evolution of reproductive isolation, is critical for the formation of new species, and an understanding of the rate at which it evolves is of great interest. That a species of oak firm, uh, Gymnocarpium, and I think that should have been italicized, could cross with a fragile fern, Cystopteris, also italicized, to produce a viable hybrid after such a long time apart, suggests that the ferns may have evolved reproductive incompatibilities much more slowly than most animals or flowering plants. If a slower speciation clock for the ferns is true, it might explain why there are only a, around 10,000 fern species on Earth today compared with around 300,000 species of flowering plants without any need to invoke competitive advantages of flowering plants per se. The story source this time is the University of Chicago Press Journals. And again, they're uh, editing it. And the reference is exactly the same as the last one. So this is one of these things that actually got two different notices in Science Daily and uh, was edited, obviously, in two different ways. Somebody thinks it's important, and there's the sort of standard form for the reference. Um, and the abstract. A fern from the, a fern from the French Pyrenees, Cystocarpium ruscamianum, is a recently formed intergeneric hybrid between parental lineages that diverged from each other approximately 60 million years ago, 95% confidence limits more or less, uh, uh, 40.2 to 76.2 million years ago. This is an extraordinarily deep hybridization event, roughly akin to an elephant hybridizing with a manatee or a human with a lemur. Ah, that's where they got that. It's in the abstract. 
In the context of other reported deep hybrids, this finding suggests that populations of ferns and other plants with abiotically that's not yeah abiotically mediated fertilization may evolve reproductive incompatibilities more slowly, perhaps because they lack many of the pre pre-mating isolation mechanisms that characterize most of the other of the groups of organisms. This conclusion implies that major features of Earth's biodiversity, such as a relatively small number of species of ferns compared with those of angiosperms, may be in part the, an indirect byproduct of this slower speciation clock rather than a direct consequence of adaptive innovations by the more diverse lineages. Gene flow among populations, hybridization broadly construed, can have a positive creative role in speciation. However, its greater impact is as a homogenizing force, reuniting populations that might otherwise have had separate evolutionary trajectories. The formation of reproductive barriers between populations is thus of central importance to evolutionary biology. And of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing, so when you see um, yellow dots, those are ellipses that I put in to show where material has been omitted. <coughs> Early investigations established a positive correlation between time since divergence of two lineages and the cumulative strength of the reproductive barriers between them. Coin and Orr, 1989, etc. cetera. Um, that coin happens to be Jerry Coyne, of whom you may have heard. Um, another important early observation is that the pace of accumulation of incompatibilities, the incompatibility clock or speciation clock, varies among taxonomic groups. For example, reproductive barriers in the Drosophila are complete within approximately four million years. That is, Drosophila lineages that diverged more than about four million years ago are unable to hybridize. And are the oldest species and are, I think that is the the oldest species pairs of African chichlids, plethodontid salamanders, hylid tree frogs, and sunfish that are still capable of producing viable hybrids diverged less than 8.5, 12, 34, and 37 million years ago, respectively. Because most of these studies were done under laboratory conditions, they precluded the possible effects of most prezygotic barriers. Therefore, they likely underestimated the rate at which incompatibilities evolve in the wild, where prezygotic barriers are often strong. Sunfish, for example, can provide viable zygotes under artificial conditions between parental line lineages that diverged up to 34 million years ago, but the most divergent sunfish species reported to produce hybrids in the wild belong to lineages that separated less than 15 million years ago. The idea is that Yes, if you deliberately cross them, you can get crosses, but, um, but they won't do it in the wild because they don't like each other or something. <coughs> Although hybridization is thought to be more common in plants than animals, there is little evidence that the rate at which reproductive barriers evolve in flowering plants differ strongly from that reported for animals. And there's a review that he quotes. For example, or that they quote, uh, for example, species of the flowering annual Colincia appear to be completely incompatible after five million years of divergence. And the deepest flowering plant hybridization we are aware of is between the grass genera Hordium and Cicale, which diverged from each other about 14 million years ago. Even the exceptional interfertile Liridodendron species pair diverged from each other only about 10 to 15 million years ago, well within the range reported for animals. Given the relatively rapid evolution of reproductive isolation in animals and flowering plants, we were surprised to encounter a fern from the French Pyrenees that was morphologically intermediate between the distantly related genera Cystopterus and Gymnocarpium. These genera are very dissimilar, um, well, to the trained eye, I guess, and until recently were placed in different subfamilies or even families. Maybe people are splitting too hard or something. 
um, though, although infertile, this fern, now named uh, Cystocarpium ruscamianum, propagates itself vigorously via rhizomes growth and does well in cultivation. Apparently, if you buy the fern itself, you can get more of them. In this study, we have two primary goals. The first is to assess the hypothesis of intergeneric hybridization using cytological and single copy nuclear sequence data from Cystocarpium and its relatives. Next, we used a series of nested empirical Bayesian analyses of plastid sequence data to estimate the divergence time of the parental lineages. Now, I'm just going to kind of move through the methods because they're, unless you're an expert, they're eye glazing and uh, they're difficult to explain. And we're kind of going to accept the results pretty much. Uh, through the second paragraph of the results, chromosome squashes of C. ruscamianum, spore mother cells, undergoing meiosis show approximately 140 stained bodies the majority of which are unpaired univalence, although a variable number of bivalence are also present. Cystocarpium is a tetraploid hybrid containing four divergent genomes consistent with the four alleles recovered in the gap CP sequence data, which is a technical way of reproducing uh, the genome or parts of it. And Here's our squashed um, in meiosis, and there's, they say there's about 140 of those things. When they get them all lined up, you can see that they're not all lined up, that some of them are off to one side instead of having everything lined up in the center. So apparently when they do meiosis, they lose or gain chromosomes that they didn't used to have uh, or did used to have in the other case. And so uh, if you're trying to perform, uh, make uh, sperm or eggs out of them while the, the, uh, the males or, and the females don't have enough chromosomes so they can't mate together and, and uh, produce fertile uh, zygotes. Uh, yes, a uh, question. Can we pass the mic up? Uh, can you go back to that picture? Sure. So, I mean, is that on the, on the right-hand side, is that a very abnormal sort of uh, arrangement for, uh, for when they're separating? Uh, when they're getting ready to separate, that's correct. It, they should be all lined up. And you can see that most of them are sort of kind of lined up, but there's quite a few of them that aren't. So this, this would be very incompatible with the ability to, uh, to, to breed and to uh, create progeny. That's right. And that's why the, that's why the fern currently uh, produces mostly rhizomes that will produce new ferns rather than rather than producing uh, uh, zygotes that will go on to produce new ferns. Okay, thanks. Um, if there was, um, I don't know what the term is, but if there is a uh, portion of chromosome that separates and moves to another chromosome, uh, when they align up like that, is there is that a problem if, if there's important uh, genes uh, on the area that's switched? Do you need sort of a, uh, what, what's it called, a lucky monster scenario where the same, the same thing has happened to the, uh, the mate? Uh, well, what you'd have to do in order to get something that was compatible is that the, the female would have to gain exactly what the male lost or vice, and, and vice versa. Uh, in order to in order to make something that was viable, and the chances of that happening are pretty slim. Okay. Uh, a question: uh, If this is a tetraploid, don't they have uh, extra material there that they can get along without? I mean, obviously it's double uh, the normal co number. Uh, 
Uh, maybe that's why it still survives. Uh, maybe so. Here's, here's the interesting thing. It's tetraplied, which means that theoretically, you know, if you missed something, it, w it shouldn't matter that much. Yeah. Uh, except that, you know, uh, tetraploidy doesn't seem to be anywhere near as, as deleterious to a plant as partial tetraploidy. Um, and we see this in humans uh, uh, probably to a greater extent, but for example in Down syndrome where you have three chromosome, I believe it's 21 if I remember correctly rather than two, and two of everything else and that imbalance even though it's all the same information is enough to give person Down syndrome. So you know, it's it's probably it's probably more of an imbalance that's giving this kind of problem than it is a actual complete missing of, of genetic information. In any case, we know they do this and we know they don't reproduce and it's very tempting to assume that the two are related. <coughs> Our final mean age estimate of the most recent common ancestor of Cystopterus and Gymnocarpium in that. I think the, those are supposed to be italicized and I missed re-italicizing them. And thus the divergence span by the uh, Cystocarpium hybridization event is 57.9 million years with the 95 highest posterior density interval spanning 40.2 to 76.2 million years ago. And I'll show you figure 1D in just a minute, uh, though it's reduced somewhat. Um, in sharp contrast to the deep divergence of the parental lineages, each of the four cystocarpium gap CP alleles differed at most by a single substitution from an allele observed in one of its parents. And thus, while the divergence between the parent lineages is ancient, the hybridization itself, uh, event itself was very recent. And uh, here's the, uh, uh, the figure that they were using to say, uh, See, 60 million years would be right here. 57 million years would be the, where the yellow dot is. And you can see that this is, it's a skewed spread um, where, where they're cutting it off um, tends to skew more towards the older age. Um, I won't go into the math um, uh, surrounding that uh, estimate, but uh, it apparently passed peer review, which means that at least some people think that it's an appropriate way to, to uh, do this. And uh, to go into the discussion, to the best of our knowledge, the formation of cystocarpium is the deepest natural hybridization yet documented in plants or animals and provides a new upper limit for the length of time it may take before reproductive barriers are complete. In this case, a cumulative total of approximately 120 million years of independent evolution. 60 million years, that is, for each parent lineage. For this event to have happened, both prezygotic isolation and hybrid viability barriers must have remained incomplete for that duration. Yet for there to be only a single known hybridization event, reproductive isolation must be strong. To explain these strong yet incomplete barriers requires that the relative strengths of these two components of reproductive isolation fall somewhere along the spectrum between strong pre isolation with little or no hybrid inviability on the one hand and no prezygotic isolation but strong hybrid inviability uh, that oh boy inviability on the other that's um, the dictation machine taking and uh, twisting that word uh, unsurprisingly examples even approaching the magnitude of the cystocarpium hybridization event are extremely rare especially outside the laboratory or cultivation. Reports of natural hybridization potentially rivaling the phylogenetic depth of the cystocarpium event are largely restricted to plants that rely on abiotic factors, that is wind and water, for their reproduction rather than on animal intermediates. And they give some examples. The gymnosperm Hesperotropsis in the Cyprus uh, family I uh, recently, that A was uh, capitalized accidentally, 
discovered a Selaginella hybrid, um, a lycophyte, and uh, four other fern hybrids. And uh, you know, you're seeing this X in front of them, and I'm assuming that that means crossbreed, although. Uh, well, I, I, I think that's what it is anyway. Uh, Dryastichium and polystichalpe and uh, Woodsia versus uh, Abea in the Woodsaceae and Lindsayasoria Asoria in the Lindsaceae. The only possible exception to this pattern that we are aware of is the hybridization of guinea fowl and chicken which are hypothesized to share a common ancestor some 30 to 70 million years ago, depending on the study. The well-documented examples of this hybridization are from captivity or artificial insemination. So apparently you can do it if you really try hard, but there are anecdotal reports of hybrids in the wild that warrant further investigation. I guess after seeing what this, these ferns can do, I would agree with that. And then we're going to skip on to the end of the paper and that includes the acknowledgments. And my, my own view on this whole thing is that this is a fascinating event. Uh, the ferns don't look that much different to my eye, and so I'm not that surprised that they, don't hybridize, that they hybridize, but uh, obviously my take is slightly different from theirs. I trust the experts that they are, in fact, different. Um, whether I should or not is a different question. The fern in question appears to be infertile as a mule. Um, it wouldn't surprise me that someday, somewhere, somebody's going to find one of these things that actually did produce a seed or two. But uh, in the meantime, since it is a plant, it doesn't have to be bred all the time. It can be reproduced by rhizomes instead of by seeds. Uh, given genetic drift, it is not clear how the species in apparently different subfamilies or perhaps families should still be able to interbreed even defectively after having been separated for some 60 million years just given genetic entropy and uh, raises the question that uh, perhaps they haven't been separated for quite that length of time uh, and uh, perhaps other interbreeding experiments illustrate the same point but uh, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. <coughs> this conclusion, of course, is based on the geological time scale. Right. Entirely on the geological time scale. We should say entirely, but it. Uh, it would not well, be a problem if you didn't put the time factor in there. That's correct. That's right. Um, so one could say, well, you know, this maybe this suggests they haven't been around that long. To well, I I can't disagree with that. I, you know that's one of the reasons I brought it up is because I think it does kind of suggest that maybe the time scale needs a little revision. Yeah, I want to make two or three comments, and then I have to take off. I have another appointment in about ten minutes in another church. <laughs> anyway, I I've spent a, half my life in Michigan. I used to collect ferns. I'm very familiar with the oak fern and the fragile fern. In the field, they're quite different the way they grow and their aspects. So I think any fern collector could readily tell the difference. So it is surprising that these two disparate species, genera, have uh, combined together. That's quite, yet it's not surprising because I know that in my fern book, they show a lot of hybrids. So, so those four hybrids that they that they quoted, or you you just say ah whatever. They're, yeah, they just cited four of the most common examples, but 
it's, it happens all the time. A lot of ferns in the wild hybridize, so that's not surprising. For them, it's surprising because of the uh, genetic distance and the time supposedly involved. Now, they mentioned one thing about uh, the hybridization being recent. I think we can probably establish that, whether looking at long ages or short chronology. Uh, their present location in the wild is in the Pyrenees in the mountains. Keep in mind that when glaciation covered all of northern Europe, it also went to southern Europe in the mountains, like all the Alps were glaciated. All the Pyrenees were glaciated. So these ferns did not start growing there until after glaciation, whenever you date it. You know, uh, if it ended 12,000 years ago with radiocarbon dating, that's a, that's a very short time versus the geological time scale. So they can prove, I think pretty much prove that this is a recent event, which makes it all the more stunning. Well, the, the interesting thing is that they say that, that at least, the, I wish they had said exactly how many bases they were dealing with, but there would be like zero to one changes from yeah. the, to the, if, from if the you're parent to the, so that, I mean, that's probably years. even more recent than 12,000, given genetic entropy. Mm -hmm. That's right. Anyway, I have to run. The comment oh. back in the back here. <coughs> Takes about three seconds to survey my understanding of ferns. <laughs> and given the great response here, I would like to tell you that I read in CNN, which is an indisputable source of truth, that the um, radical Muslim groups, the ISIS, has forbidden the raising of doves, which is a popular pastime for people in that area, because doves flying over devout Muslims offend them with their genitalia. And so people there, young people particularly, who enjoy flying doves have, are being arrested, fined, beaten, and it said three put to death for this offense against the sensibilities of Islam. Well, I don't know much about ferns. I, knew, I know a little bit more about birds. And obvious bird genitalia is difficult to observe, very difficult to observe. I don't know what this has to do with the ferns, <laughs> but it does show that you can develop theories <laughs> based <laughs> not exactly on truth. Well, to be fair, uh, songbirds have been shown in, in some cases to cross in uh, uh, in some different ways. Well, one of the, I guess, one of the interesting things is that it now turns out that all of the Darwin's finches can interbreed. So, depending on how you define it, they have now all become one species. It also raises an interesting question because apparently there are animals and plants that can at least combine to um, living organisms whether or not they reproduce well. Mule is one. Uh, you can get zebras and horses. I've seen them as horses and zonkeys and things like that. Um, yeah, ligers, tions, depending on which one is the male and which one's the female. 
And that kind of suggests that um, crossing isn't as hard as we have always thought it to be. And in some cases, it almost looks like some of the crosses may be uh, between families that weren't originally intended to, at least originally intended to easily interbreed. What about the duck-billed platypus? Uh, well, you know, that's an interesting question, although since they reproduce well, they wouldn't be an illustration of what I'm talking about. And it, it came to mind that I wonder whether originally mankind was given the freedom to be able to cross breed things more uh, more easily than we can do now mm -hmm. and that, that this is uh, intended to be part of creation uh, our, our ability to actually do that kind of thing and that uh, uh, perhaps the abuse of that uh, was uh, uh, was something that, uh, among other things, created uh, uh, some of the dinosaurs and perhaps uh, even uh, uh, fulfilled the wickedness of the uh, antediluvian world. But that's kind of speculating, and I don't have a lot of information on that. Uh, Professor H.W. Clark, from whom I took a number of classes, I got very much involved in this question of uh, amalgamation and so on. He uh, did suggest that animals and plants originally were much more virulent than they are now. In other words, you, what you could hybridize originally because of vitality that was there would not work now because we have degenerated so much. Are you trying to tell me that my idea isn't original? I'm crushed. <laughs> um, I took a botany in college, and the only thing that I can remember about ferns was something that really surprised and sort of pleased me to learn, and that is that uh, you know you look under the the underside of, I forget if it was male or female, ferns, and there's these sort of these dark spots of structures that apparently the, the um, uh, let's say it's female, I don't know, but uh, <clears throat> where the, um, what, what do ferns give out? Is, do they give out pollen or? Spores. Spores, spores okay. as I recall, yeah. So spores go, go <coughs> in, into these, let's say, female uh, ferns and actually um, impregnate there. Um, so I, I guess I'm sort of wondering by this parallel, I think it's a geologic time parallel, of, of humans and lemurs and what was it, something in manatees? Well, uh, elephants? Yeah, elephants and manatees. It would seem to me as though that there is a, a almost a physical disability to transfer, um, you know, sperm from one of those species to the other. Um, and uh, whereas it seems to me as though perhaps because it's actually spores, uh, that it might be more easy able to, to transfer. So I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, um, if we were to do sort of, uh, I, I think it was mentioned here, but just clarification, if we were to do in vitro fertilization between related species, might it be, how much more likely would it be to actually produce a viable offspring as opposed to the getting over the barriers that are just the physical barriers, not really the, the biologic or, or genetic barriers? Um, <clears throat> well, the best, the best answer I can give for that is obviously it can happen more easily if we put some effort into it than if we just let it happen naturally. The, uh, whatever you want to do with the with the evolutionary time between sunfishes, for example, you've got to say that it is obvious that some crosses that we can do in the laboratory aren't 
at least observably done in the wild. Uh, that may be partly because we don't watch long enough, um, but it certainly indicates that, uh, that uh, how shall I say, intelligently designed hybridization is more um, uh, more efficient than um, natural hybridization, which I guess shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, really. Right. Well, you mentioned fish. Are fish, do the females lay eggs out in the open and then the males simply... Spray sperm all over the general area and lets it swim into the eggs. In, in which case, all sorts of species of male fish sperm are... Are, have easy access to all sorts of species of female eggs. True, although I suppose that it would be more efficient to have the same species uh, having the sperm and the eggs, they'll fit together better. Let's put it this way, if they don't fit together better, <coughs> the species rapidly goes extinct. By fit together, you mean like? Um, I don't know, the sperm finds it easier to locate the egg, to penetrate the, the, the cell wall of the egg, et cetera, than some other species of fish. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't yet seen a uh, cross between, let's say, salmon and bass, even though I'm sure that there's somewhere, somewhere, some salmon eggs that got exposed to bass sperm and accidentally, if no other way. I did read an article this morning on sperm accumulating and helping one another in certain instances in various species. Instead of each sperm going for its own viability, they would join together and have better chance of reproduction. But I wonder if there's more to the biblical prohibition of against bestiality here. Well, if bestiality were a, a uh, uh, an actual uh, offspring were an actual possibility, then I think that there would be a a larger moral reason to mm -hmm. avoid it than just simply uh, perversion of of uh, of the God-given gift of sex. I think you're right about that. Do these folks uh, discuss at all the possibility their taxono taxonomy is uh, overemphasized? Uh, I mean, one person's family is another person's species. Uh, almost, uh, I, I, I realize they, they have some, from, from their chart there, they have some uh, position or suggestion of differences there to, to support their 60 million years, but uh, is it possible that uh, these are not as separate as they think they are? Well, I think you'd have to say yes, that it's possible. The question is, <coughs> uh, well, if you make that, that is hypothesis, it, is, it is, likely? is there any way of testing it? Yeah. And that's, I think, the real question, is how would you know? Well, I'd, 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 uh, <coughs> I'd want uh, some kind of standard in the DNA uh, pattern. Uh, you, you want to sequence the, both those species and uh, try and use some criterion to say, hey, you know, these, these are uh, really separate. Well, they apparently have gotten precisely that in that they... They've sequenced it? They've sequenced it, partially sequenced Partially it. sequenced it, mm -hmm. Complete sequences are a lot harder to go for, but partial se sequences do match, in some cases, to within a, uh, within a mutation of the, uh, uh, of the parent species. But the, uh, you know, does that extend for the entire genome? I don't know. Um, one would 
assume that the ones we don't test are similar to the ones that we do test. But uh, how you would know, and there's a lot of work to be done. And of course, all that work takes money, and that means you have to get grants. And that means you have to write articles like this and publicize them so that the grant people are suitably impressed to give you more money. Yeah, well, yeah, I think th this is an example, of course, where a, uh, the intellectual matrix of the, um, of the uh, community, the scientific community, uh, uh, kind of uh, dictates uh, what is a problem and what is not a problem, and uh, raises a, a, the more serious problem, and that is uh, we don't test that in the electoral matrix. We, we're trapped into it. Well, see, that's one of the things that I'm suggesting is that stories like this enable us to at least look outside of the intellectual matrix to ask the question what it would it look like if uh, the time frame weren't as um, uh, uh, weren't as long as commonly assumed. The other thing that I think that uh, that we need to be careful about assuming is that the uh, that the molecular clock is as slow as they say, because everywhere that we have actually tested it it seems to be faster. Uh, and that raises some very interesting questions. Um, and, you know, I, I think a couple of weeks ago I had talked about uh, using modern known rather than evolutionarily estimated mutation rates. Um, for various species, and see whether you could whether you could count for, for example, chimpanzees and bonobos being originally part of the exact same pair, mm -hmm. yeah. and the, and that uh, and that you could trace it back to mm -hmm. 4,300 or 5,500 or whenever the uh, um, ark landed years ago. Because if you could start if you could start honing in on it, you say 5,000 years, it would provide not only a confirmation of a uh, of a an arc as, uh, of some kind of genetic bottleneck at the same time as the arc was supposed to have landed, but uh, you would also raise the predictive power of creationist theory because you would be able to say, and we're going to see a, a large number of things that go back to 5,000 years, and then we're going to see other things that will be variously related but will be considerably later, longer than 5,000 years, and those kinds of things may have actually gotten onto the ark in an entirely, you know, as separate animals. And while you can't do that for plants, uh, you certainly can do that for, uh, for animals. I, I think that thinking outside of the box that is, uh, that is given to us by modern science may very well give mm -hmm. us uh, uh, rewards that wouldn't be there if we stayed inside that box. I think this happens in geology all the time. That uh, I mean, if you think in terms of uh, what used to be the scientific matrix, that there was a major world catastrophe, the flood, and so on, and uh, uh, that uh, you tried to explain things in terms of that event uh, versus now, you know, you uh, uh, don't allow that story. Uh, this tells us, you know, just what, what, how this matrix uh, uh, affects things. But man, you go out there and you, if you look at the, those tremendously widespread layers, everything so flat out there, and marker beds running for hundreds of miles, and all this stuff. Uh, you, you know, there's no, there's no uh, geological saying. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. Uh, 
this applies <laughs> this applies uh, to any situation, of course. But but man, if you uh, if you approach things from a different paradigm, you, you raise a whole bunch of different questions, and uh, you find all kinds of evidence out there. It's uh, it's striking. Uh, and we're totally, I shouldn't say totally, we are, we're largely unaware of this bias because we fall into these into, into the matrix, the current matrix, so easily. And the vocabulary of the matrix defines the matrix often and so on. And you, you're just kind of uh, caught in it. Uh, and you know, to redo all the uh, stuff is, is not realistic. But uh, Well, so. it may be forced on us. That's the thing that we need to keep in mind. <coughs> and I think we can start one piece at a time. <coughs> and uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples that I'm thinking of right now. One of them is um, the Box Canyon. Um, after it had been known that major floods over uh, land masses were possible, <coughs> uh, that is, the Brett's Flood. Uh, Box Canyon sat for another 50 plus years being explained <coughs> as seepage into a uh, canyon that gradually eroded from the bottom. Yeah. And then somebody did calculations as to how much seepage you'd have to have, how fast it would have to run, and it's way more than it is now, and it's way more than you would expect <coughs> in the rainfall in the area. And furthermore, if you lift it up, uh, lift up your eyes beyond the Box Canyon and say, where else do we see this kind of thing? Well, you can see it at Dry Falls. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and, and then they started looking for things like scour at the edge of the canyon, plunge pools, and all of a sudden the whole thing just opens up. Oh, of mm -hmm. course, this is a flood. It has mm -hmm. to be a flood. You can even roughly estimate how fast it was. Uh, the thing was sitting there for 50 years with the new paradigm sitting there waiting to be applied and nobody bothered to apply it. Because mm -hmm. what happened was the people said, oh, well, you know, this happened once. <coughs> well, maybe it happened again in Siberia somewhere. And, and then everybody just kind of ignored the possibility everywhere else. Uh, and I, you know, I think that uh, creationist geologists should be able to take those kind of criteria and go to uh, some other formations and say, look at here, here it is. Now, to be fair, I think that some of that work is actually being done, um, and I won't mention where because there are some people who are trying to get papers written and, and, their, uh, and a geology degree, but, but I... Mm -hmm. <coughs> As I understand it, they're actually doing some of this stuff. Um, the second example I'll give you is carbon-14. Looking mm -hmm. for carbon-14 in very old material, if you're thinking inside mm -hmm. the box, you'll never do that. If you're thinking outside the box, you're going, well, we ought to at least look, and then the more you look, the more you find. And uh, there's, we will see what happens, but I, uh, we may even be surprised at uh, where that gets in the published literature. The, the paleotopography uh, is, of at least the Paleozoic, Mesozoic paleotopography is such a striking contrast to the present topography. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's so obvious you go out there, you, you look at that, that, that uh, uh, but no, that's not allowed in, uh, in, in the, the current matrix of, uh, of science right now. Well, I think yeah, that the, uh, it'll be a very interesting to see Mesozoic to Cenozoic topography being reworked as a uh, as erosional features, M massive giant erosional features. Um, but uh, just one little question, getting back to the paper here. Uh, these folks were satisfied that they had there is no me uh, uh, metaphase plate, uh, or is this is just in the process, you know. Uh, yeah. They're satisfied that the that a metaphase plate does not uh, contain all the chromosomes. I don't think they're saying there's no plate, but because it doesn't contain the chrom all the chromosomes, then some of the chromosomes are going to separate in a uh, non uh, symmetrical manner. 
And when they do, then it takes, uh, you might almost say, an act of God to get the sperm and the egg to match well enough to, to, to mate and produce a, a, a viable hybrid. But it looks very odd to me. And um, uh, well, uh, read that article if you can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so on. But um, more significant is this matter of the influence of our matrix. It's, yeah. it's so obvious in this paper here. Well, here's the thing. I think that we as creationists have an opportunity now to say, are these original created kinds or are they not? And to ask mm -hmm. how much variation, mm -hmm. how much variation happens from plant to plant, mm -hmm. for example. Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, mm -hmm. how much variation happens in 20 years, happens in 100 years, happens in 200 years. Do we have some old pressed ferns that we can, you know, from 1865 or something, that we can, that we can get some kind of a handle on how much mutation is happening from one fern to the next? And then, and then using that as your yardstick, say, well, how far back do you have to go before they join? And that would give us a clue as to whether this is just extra hybridization of the Clark variety or whether mm -hmm. this is actually one original created kind. And if we start being able to make distinctions like that pretty clearly, um, and, and once we've gotten to, you know, this is probably one created kind, we can start drawing other conclusions from it that are testable and test them and find out that we're right, um, then we have science. I have a question. Did, yeah. um, you were talking about hybridization today. Could this be where all the, all the, uh, all the, the ape creatures that they found in, in, in Africa, could this, and families of them, and generations of them, could this be from hybridization, or is that just an offshoot of apes? Well, as a matter of fact, Elise Spencer has been suggesting that that's a possibility for some time. Uh, they've been working on stuff that they're, they presented to science. Well, we had all those skulls there at uh, St. George, you remember? Yeah, they presented it to the St. George uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. place after having run it through people a couple of times. And I don't know whether they're going to show that in the general conference or not. It, from what I've heard, that that's a possibility. So that uh, the rest of the Adventist world will be able to see some of the uh, possible <laughs> evidence for that. So the answer is yes, that's a possibility. It's one that we uh, that <coughs> you know one may wish that it could be ruled out, but I'm not sure that we can completely rule it out. And if it does, it may explain why you have um, <coughs> what is sometimes called mosaic evolution. That is to say, you'll have a branch here that will have one feature and a branch here that will have another feature but not the one. And so they, they, they seem to be kind of mix and matching rather than a nice linear tree with branches coming out of it. Um, uh, and uh, I guess you could call that mosaic evolution in more than one sense. <laughs> so, well, so like, I mean, for instance, I mean, in National Geographic, they've been talking about how, Cro about, um, not Cro-Magnon, but I mean, um, the Neanderthals. Neanderthals. You know, they were around when, the, when modern humans were. Right, and not only that, but there were some genes that we share in common now. Yeah. And Heidelberg man the same way, and uh, there's another one, um, Homo erectus, I think. And they found, in fact, in Georgia, where they've been, that's the country of Georgia rather than the state of Georgia, um, that there are actually some... Uh, uh, some collections of fossils that look like a family except that the family members are extremely diverse and uh, 
some of them look like Heidelberg men, and some of them look like Neanderthals, and some of them look like uh, uh, standard old Homo erectus. And the, there's there's a big brouhaha about it, and people suggesting that maybe there was only one species, and they may have been right. On the other hand, maybe there's some cross species uh, gene flow that. Uh, Well, the idea is that a, that a Neanderthal, well, creationists think that, they all, that modern humans came, of course, from Adam. That means you would also have to say that, that Neanderthals came from Adam, or they were just an offshoot, or what? If they can crossbreed, you'd, you'd think that they at least partly came from Adam. Um, if there has been human ape uh, breeding, uh, raises some very interesting questions about, you know, how much of all of us is actually human. And if you're going to be really picky, the Europeans have the most chance of having something else besides, uh, besides human genes in them. Because apparently we have more Neanderthal genes than Africans do just which is kind of interesting wouldn't uh, you, you expect that geographically probably so probably so uh, but the point of it is that if if you're going to sort of dive into the deep dark recesses of racism um, uh, if you're a European that's going to come back to bite you Well, it's something else I've always wondered. I mean, they, we talk about basically, you know, Macedonia or near Babylon being sort of the cradle of, or, or Iraq being the cradle of civilization where the supposedly the Garden of Eden was. But, you know, evolutionists think it all came from Africa. We've never found anything in, the Mes in an area that's something close to what they found in Africa, have we? Well, that's a... I think they're more willing to date things older in Africa. Uh, and the, I think the dating methods are, well, just let's just say less than completely secure. And that if push came to shove, those methods can be overturned. Probably the best example I can give you of is uh, a Triassic uh, bird-like dinosaur tracks. Uh, that were securely dated by an index fossil and argon-argon dating, which is a variant of potassium argon dating and supposedly the most reliable one, at uh, was 130 million years or something like that. And, um, and that was all fine and good until they started discovering peculiarities about these tracks, like the tracks, there'd be a whole bunch of tracks around, and then there would be a set of tracks that would begin in the middle of some other tracks, just out of nowhere. And uh, as a matter of fact, those tracks had a prolonged, uh, I think it's actually second finger, but it behaves like a thumb on the back, where they, where they would apparently have flown in and dragged themselves. And you find enough of these kinds of evidences, and pretty soon you're starting to say, those got to be birds. They're not bird-like dinosaurs. They're birds. Well, of course, this creates a crisis, because how did birds 400, 140 million years ago? There's no way. So somebody dug out lead-lead dating and, and worked it on the same thing. And all of a sudden, the evidence is now that they're Eocene, which is 50, 60 million years old, and of course, birds are all around by then. And uh, so the problem is solved. Except in the meantime, what you've just done is you have trashed argon argon dating, and you have trashed. Uh, carbon no, the um, uh, index fossil dating, which is supposed to be the very best. So now who do you believe? 
Well, that's part of the problem is, and what do you believe? Um, you, you see, if your belief system is centered around, nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. Then, of course, that's where you're going to go. If your belief system centers around a short age, then you're going to have an entirely different model. It won't be just tweaked here and there. It will, things will have to be massively taken out and put back together again. And I think sometimes we have no idea exactly how massive that uh, taking out apart and putting back together is. And when I say we, I include myself. I've had some glimpse of how, how much you have to work at it. But, but uh, we're just not, we haven't worked at it to the extent that we can or should. Anyway, come back next week. We'll have some more fun. Um, I've forgotten what I said I was going to do, but then that might change anyway, so.